sāksim, varbūt var izslēgt to, to, es nezinu, kas tur mūzika vairāk nav, un ieņemiet vietas. Un pirmais, man ir viens tāds lūgums, pirmā solā varbūt kāds ir paņēmis, kolēģi vien bija atstājusi jāku ar somiņu, ja kāds ir paņēmis no pirmās rindas, daktarei Valdmanai. Ok, dear, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are continuing our, our congress uh, with the plenary lectures. And uh, as a first speaker, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Hotznecker from Switzerland, and his team is Adverse Cutaneous Drug Reactions. Please. Dear chairpersons, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity today to talk about adverse cutaneous drug reactions. So I arrived uh, with my wife yesterday evening uh, in Riga and we had a walk through the town and um, I think Riga is really beautiful and I enjoyed myself yesterday. So we as dermatologists experience cutaneous drug reactions every day. It's an important topic. And most cutaneous drug reactions, like 98%, are of the benign form. So we easily recognize them, and then we stop the culpit drug, and then we apply some topical corticosteroids, and the case is done. However, in very rare cases, about 2% of the cutaneous drug reactions, we are confronted with severe cutaneous drug reactions. And, as, and we, as dermatologists, it's our task to identify those severe cutaneous drug reactions immediately, stop the culpit drug, and apply the appropriate treatment to the patients because severe cutaneous drug reactions are associated with high mortality. So here's my ambitious plan for my lecture today. First, we talk about the benign forms of cutaneous drug eruptions like the classical maculopapular rash, then some baboon syndrome and fixed drug eruptions. Then I will quickly touch base with the severe cutaneous drug eruptions like the Stephen Ton syndrome and the toxic epidermal necrolysis, where you will have a talk by Professor Chris Bunker tomorrow. Then we move on to the AGAP and the DRESS syndromes. So what are adverse drug reactions? Well, adverse drug reactions are defined as unpredictable adverse events of a medication given. First, at a normal dose, second, by a normal route, and third, for a diagnostic, prophylactic, or therapeutic purpose. So we all know that drug reactions are very common. However, the skin is actually one of the most frequently involved organs by drug side effects. So we all know from pre-marketed clinical trials that we observe cutaneous drug reactions about 1%. However, we all know that this is not the case because when we look at certain drug groups like painkillers, antibiotics or antibiotics, we know that the incident to experience adverse cutaneous drug reactions is much higher. And then, on a daily basis, when we work in hospital, we even know that the incidence is much higher because our hospitalized patients are usually elders, they are ill, and usually they take not just one drug, but more than one. So what are the predisposing factors for cutaneous drug reaction? Well, first, we have the age. We all know that all the patients in hospital are prone to develop cutaneous drug reactions. Then, our patients usually, when they are very sick, they are not just taking one drug, but they are taking simultaneous medication. So we have the case of polymedication. And this increases dramatically the risk to suffer severe cutaneous drug reactions. Then you all know that patients that are immunosuppressed, like patients that suffer from HIV infection or lymphomas or leukemia, have a higher chance to develop severe cutaneous drug reaction. Now, this is kind of paradoxically, because in patients with AIDS, 
eights, we know that when the CD4 count drops below 200, we have an increased risk that goes up to 50 folds to a normal patient person that the AIDS patient suffers severe cutaneous drug reaction. Now this is a matter of discussion, but it's thought that also the low numbers of CD4 positive regulatory T cells are down in those patients, and that's the cause why they suffer from severe cutaneous drug reactions. Then you all know the classical form of EBV infection, where we then take antibiotics and then we uh, suffer from macular papular rash. So viral co-infection are an important predisposing factor. Now as research moves on, we have identified patients with a certain HLA background. And when they take certain drugs, they have a much higher susceptibility to suffer from severe cutaneous drug reaction like Stephen Johnson syndrome or toxic epidermal necrolysis. And then there are slow acetylators that also have some problems when taking certain drugs. So let's now come back to cutaneous drug eruption. I have already mentioned that you can divide them in like two big groups. On the one hand, we have the benign cutaneous drug eruption, which make up about 98% of the cases. So we see them like every day in our private practice, and usually those patients are not at risk. But then, as dermatologists, we should be able to pick out and to diagnose the patients suffering from severe cutaneous drug reactions, like Stephen Johnson syndrome, like toxic epidermal necrolysis, about 10 which make up about 2% of all the patients we see with cutaneous drug reaction, and we should stop the culpit drug and make the right diagnosis immediately, because severe cutaneous drug reactions are potentially lethal, as you know. So let's start with the classical maculopapular rash. Usually, you all know this, it starts 7 to 14 days after intake of the culpit drug. You have this nice symmetrical distribution of the lesions. Sometimes the patients suffer from fever and pruritus, and the macular papula rash is weak to moderate. Here's another example of one patient. Please note that the lesions can have certain polymorphism. You can see macula, you can see purples, and sometimes you can even see, because of stasis, non-palpable purpura of the legs. Here's one of the classical examples. You have a patient that suffers from an HPV infection, and when they then give ampicillin to the patients, you increase the chance to suffer from a macular papula rash from approximately 7% up to 100%. So giving a patient suffering from EBV infection, ampicillin, really can help you make the diagnosis of mononucleosis. What are the differential diagnoses of macular papular rash? Of course, there's the large group of viral exanthemas like measles. You all know this. Then you have to think of urticaria, secondary syphilis, and HIV primary infection. So now let's move on and talk about the baboon syndrome, and now it's called STRIVE, which stands for Symmetrical Drug-Related Interjections and Flexural Exanthema. But it's all the same, right? So this is an, a, a special group of macular papular rash, which is, sent, which is located to send to certain areas of the body. So here you have the erythemous maculas, which have a tendency to confluent at the bottoms, the large body folds, and at the inguic genital regions. And mostly you suffer from a baboon syndrome because you have taken antibiotics like amoxicillin or cephalosporins. Then you all know the case of the fixed drug eruption. It's a very, it's a clinical, very characteristic adverse cutaneous drug reaction. Once you have seen it, you will never forget it. Usually, one to two weeks after the first exposure to the drugs, the patient develops just sometimes just one, sometimes more than one sharply delimited round amethystus plaques with has a kind of violet impression. There can be blisters, but usually there are not. What is very characteristic to fixed drug eruption is that when you re-expose the patient to the drug again, then 
on the same location within 24 hours, patients again suffer from fixed drug eruption, which can be very important for diagnosis. If you again then do allergological testing and you want to do epicutaneous testing, you have to test on the previously affected uh, site, skin site, because it's now known that fixed cutaneous drug eruptions are caused by resident memory T cells, which only reside specifically in the area of the previous drug eruption. One further, clean, one further characteristic clinical sign is that usually it heals up within days with a post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. So now let's talk about the severe cutaneous drug eruptions, which are not very common, but which are very important. So what are severe cutaneous drug eruption? Well, you all know the Stephen Johnson syndrome, which was first described in 1922 by Mr. Stephen and Mr. Johnson. And then we have the toxic epidermal necrolysis. Now there has been some discussion going on whether those are separate entities, but now Stephen Johnson syndrome and TAN are seen as a continuum spectrum of one disease. Then we have the acute generalized eczematous postulosis, the so-called ACEP. And then we have the hypersensitivity syndrome, like the DRESS. So when should we worry? So presume a patient comes to your private practice and he has a macular papular rash on your skin. Usually it's a benign form, I've just told you that. But don't miss the severe forms. And then uh, there are some certain clinical characteristics that should increase your suspicion of severe cutaneous drug reaction. So always look on the patient. If the patient has a facial edema, this means a swollen uh, face, you should be aware that this patient might suffer of dress. If you see a marked eosinophilia in the blood, this also suggests that the patient might suffer from a hypersensitivity syndrome. Look at the mucosas and the conjunctival lesions. If the patient complains about burning eyes and painful skin, the patient says, well, when you touch my skin, it's painful. This is also a sign that the patient suffers from a severe cutaneous drug reaction and not from a very benign form. If the color has this grayish skin color, like the one shown here, this is a sign that the skin is undergoing apoptosis. And if you do the Nekoski phenomenon, this means you rub on the skin and you see epidermal detachment and erosions, this for sure is a sign of severe cutaneous drug eruptions. So what do we know? So toxic epidermal necrolysis was first described by Mr. Lyle in the British Journal of Dermatology in 1956. And he reported a case of four patients and he described it as toxic eruptions, which closely resemble scaling. And Mr. Lyle at this time thought that those patients had suffered burn wounds. He didn't know at this time that those patients had suffered a severe cutaneous drug eruption. Speaking about Stephen Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis, I've already told you that now this is seen as a spectrum, as a continuum of one disease. So on the one hand, we have the classical maculopapular rash, which has like no mortality. So all patients usually survive. And characteristically, you have no epidermal detachments. So if you rub on the skin, you will never get a blister or an erosion. Then, if you have epidermal detachment in one to five percent of the whole body area, then you can talk about Stephen Johnson syndrome and mortality is up to 5%. And this increases as more skin is involved and in toxic epidermal necrolysis, still undergoing uh, extensive research, we still have a mortality which makes up about 30%. So what are the clinical characteristics of Stephen Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis? Well, usually you have an onset of the symptoms within four weeks after initiation of the new drug, which is quite a long time, right? Clinically, patients suffer from certain prodromes like fever. They complain about burning eyes and they might have a pharyngitis. 
then a painful macular rash develops, which is usually centralized. So it usually affects this, the face and the breast, the thorax. You have this dusky grayish color and the onset on the face and the thorax. Then usually those macular papular rash rapidly confluence and you experience first signs of skin detachment by doing the Nikolsky phenomenon and you can see bulle like this here. And you also, like you can see here in this patient, you have involvement of the mucosal and conjunctival erosions. So here's one more case of a Stephen Johnson syndrome. You can see here erosions on the lips, so mucosal involvement, and then you can see here the macular papular rush, and on the macular papular rush, epidermal detachment has taken place. You can see blisters, and uh, you can see erosions here in the closer view. So Stephen Johnson and Tennyson overlap syndrome. If less than 10% of the whole body surface area is affected by epidermal detachment, you can make the diagnosis of Stephen Johnson syndrome. Then epidermal detachment centralizes more to the face and the thorax, and it makes up 10 to 30%. Then you can speak about the Stephen Johnson 10 overlap syndrome. And it we have more than 30% of skin detachment you for sure suffer from a toxic epidermal necrolysis, which is, of course, associated with the highest mortality. Here, one picture of a patient suffering from toxic epidermal necrolysis. Again, you have the centralized macular papular rush with the involvement of the eyes and the mucosa of the mouth. You can see here this massive epidermal uh, skin detachment, and you have the grayish apoptotic epidermis that somehow just like floods away. And then here again on the hands, you have one erosion and epidermal skin detachment. So what's the clinical pathological correlation of toxic epidermal necrolysis? Well, if you take a skin biopsy out of one of those skin lesions and look at it under the microscope, you see massive keratinocyte apoptosis, which you can see here by uh, those uh, reddish keratinocytes. This means that in toxic epidermal necrolysis, you have epidermal necrolysis, and in the pathology, you see that those keratinocytes undergo apoptosis. Now, we know that certain drugs affect specific uh, lymphocytes, and then this somehow triggers fast ligand and granulizing, and this leads to this massive apoptosis. However, how the drug sensitizes the specific lymphocytes is not known today. So as research moved on, um, certain groups have identified genetic markers for Stephen Johnson syndrome. And I just want to mention one of the first papers which was published in Nature Medicine because I think you will hear more about this tomorrow by Professor Bunker on toxic epidermal necrolysis. And here they could show that when patients uh, in uh, Taiwan uh, took carbamazepine, they had a very high chance to uh, suffer from toxic e from Stephen Johnson syndrome, much higher chance than patients from Europe. And then they looked and then they could find that those patients that nearly 100% developed Stephen Johnson syndrome had a certain HLA phenotype, B1502. And if those patients were negative for those uh, HLA phenotype, only 3% of those patients developed a Stephen Johnson syndrome. So what can we do in the management of Stephen Johnson and 10? Well, actually not much. We can rapidly identify and stop the caltric drug. We can give the patient supportive therapy. Usually those patients lie in a burn unit in ICU. They have nursing, nutrition, and hydroelectric support. But what about specific therapy? Well, there is no evidence-based specific therapy now. So there have been one trial on thalidomide, but please don't give it to your patients because patients with 10 and Stephen Johnson treated with thalidomide had a higher mortality than just the patients that received placebo. 
there have been some case series on short-term high-dose corticosteroids. There are like more than 10 case series on IVIGs. There are some case reports on biologicals and then there are some case series and case reports on cyclosporin A. So what are the differential diagnoses of Stephen Johnson syndrome in 10? So here is the erythema multiforme mayor, and you also should think of the staphylococcal scaled skin syndrome. So there has been some discussion going on whether erythema multiforme major might be some form of Stephen Johnson syndrome. However, now it's believed that Stephen Johnson syndrome is clearly separated from erythema multiforme major, where in erythema multiforme major you have these specific targetoid lesions. You can also have mucosal involvement. Then here is one, a child that suffers from SSSS. And here you have the classical form of subcorneal detachment, which is due to a staphylococcal toxin. Now this has nicely been described in a nature paper where they could show that bacteria producing the exfoliate toxin A targets specifically desmoglein 1. And you all know that desmoglein 1 is very much important for skin integrity. So if you have a patient and you have the suspicion for toxic epidermal necrolysis, please take a skin biopsy, snap freeze it, make a cryosection, and then stain it. And then you can easily discriminate between TAN and SSSS, because in TAN you see the cleft is much more deeper in the epidermis, whereas in the SSSS you have a cleft in the stratum corneum. So now let's move on to acute generalized eczematous pustulosis, the so-called ACEP. So this is a classical form of a drug eruption where you can find non-follicular bound sterile pustules. So those patients don't suffer from a bacterial infection, they have sterile pustulosis. Usually have an ex exanthema in the face and in the folds, you have fever, you have neutrophilia, you have a rapid appearance following the drug and also a spontaneous healing with much desquamations and usually antibiotics are involved. Still you have a mortality which can go up as high as 5%. So in the early phases of ARGAP you find those pustulosis distributed non-follicular bound through the whole body and after as the um, skin disease resembles you see a, a prominent scaling with this combination within days. So how do you manage ARGAP? Well you stop the Calpit drug, usually it's enough to give topical corticosteroid and you can lower the fever with enzymes. The most important differential diagnosis is the pustular psoriasis. But then you can go back and ask the patients, have you ever suffered from psoriasis? And usually he knows. So now one of, one of an important adverse severe cutaneous drug correction is the so-called DRESS, which is the drug rush with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms, or also DICE, as they call it in other countries. So this is a very specific cutaneous adverse drug correction, which is characterized by eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. So in this case, not only the skin is involved, but also the organs, which make it quite complicated. Usually, the onset is within greater three weeks after first intake of the drug. And you know that those patients often take anti-epileptics. And we know of cases where the DRESS syndrome developed three months after the first intake of the anti-epileptics. So what are the signs and symptoms? So patients suffer from a diffuse macular papula, sometimes pustular exanthema. And so you have to be careful not to, uh, um, not to um, think just only of a plain macular papula rash. Because patients with dress 
also have a classical facial edema. So they have this swollen skin, as you can see here. They have fever, they have lymphadenopathy, so you can really feel the, the swollen lymph nodes. If you take some blood, you see a marked eosinophilia and you have a pronounced lycocytosis. And when you look at the lycocytes under the microscope, you see that they have an atypical phenotype. You have systemic involvement, that's very important. Usually, you have an hepatitis and defined by elevated lymphocytes, but you can also have pulmonary infiltrates or nephrophritis. The mortality can go up to 10%. So here are some clinical pictures of patients suffering from dress. You can see here the classical facial edema. You can see the maculopapular rush, sometimes little targetoid impression. If you take blood from these patients, you see the eosinophilia, you see the involvement of the internal organs. Here's another patient suffering from dress, and please note that also the edema can affect the ears, which can be nicely seen here. Here the maculopapular is not very pronounced. So what's the pathogenesis of dress? Well, not much is known about this. It's known that it's kind of immune reaction with production of IL-5 and eosinophilia, and possibly there is a role of HH6 and HH7 reactivation. And this was nicely described in a science translational paper where you have viral reactivation in 76% of the cases. So if you suffer from dress, there is a clinical characteristic course. First you have the exanthema and then in like sample symptoms like fever, lymph, adenohepatitis, pop up, vanish and go back again. And then two to four weeks after the start of the exanthema, you, you can detect herpes virus 6 reactivation in the blood of the patients. So what's the treatment? You have to stop the culture drug and then please treat the patient with systemic steroids, usually one to two milligram per body, kilogram body weight, and you have to treat long, because if you damper out the corticosteroids too early, you have a high chance of suffering a rebound. You have a slow resolution, the dress can take weeks to months. So here I come to my conclusion. So if you see a patient with, and you suspect a cutaneous drug eruption, please look for certain clinical characteristics because they should make us aware of severe cutaneous drug eruption. We shouldn't miss those patients. And in that case, we should rapidly identify and stop the drug. We should make the specific diagnosis with clinic and histology, and then we should start appropriate therapy. Thank you for your attention. Dear Dr. Kostnaker, thank you for your presentation. We are a little bit out of time, but maybe one or two questions from auditorium. If no, thank you. And I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Adaskevich from Belarus. And his topic is acute skin failure causes and management. Please. Dear Chairman, uh, dear colleagues, uh, acute skin failure is a state of total dysfunction of the skin resulting from uh, different dermatological conditions. Uh, it constitutes a dermatological emergency and requires a multidisciplinary intensive care approach. Its effective management is possible only when the underlying pathomechanism of each event is clear to the treating uh, clinician. Skin failure has been uh, <clears throat> defined as uh, loss of normal temperature control with inability to maintain the core body temperature and failure to prevent percutaneous loss of fluid, electrolytes and protein with results in imbalance and failure of the mechanical barrier to prevent penetration of foreign materials. Acute versus chronic and end-stage skin failure. Acute rapid onset occurs simultaneously with a critical uh, illness. Chronic slower steady presentation occurs during ongoing disease state prevalent in elderly patients with multiple comorbidities and 
age stage occurs at the end of life associated with increased morbidity and mortality of the patient. Causes of acute skin failure are erythroderma or exfoliative, dermatitis, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, toxic epidermal necrolysis, acute generalized pustular psoriasis, immunobulous disorders, infections, Staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, febrile viral exanthemas. Erythroderma or exfoliative dermatitis is a severe and sometimes life threatening condition characterized by a, by a universal inflammatory affection of the skin, erythema, disquamation, itching, generalized lymphadenopathy, and fever. Signs of erythroderma are flaking skin, peeling skin, red skin, scaly skin, swollen, crusted skin, fever, and feeling cold. Criteria of erythroderma required erythema over most of the body uh, surface, uh, more than 90% major. Uh, fever, more uh, uh, satiate gut, generalized exfoliation, minor, history of psoriasis, eczema, recent drug reaction, uh, cutaneous T lymphoma. Causes of erythroderma are uh, pre existing skin diseases, drugs, leukemia, infections, neoplasias, genetic and maybe idiopathic erythroderma. Skin diseases causing uh, exfoliative dermatitis and associated systemic uh, disorders. Systemic complications of erythroderma are septicemia, acute respiratory distress syndrome, hypoalbuminemia, the compensation of chronic liver disease, cardiac failure, tachycardia, thermoregulatory disturbances, fluid and electrolyte imbalance. The cutaneous and extracutaneous manifestations of erythroderma. The cutaneous manifestations are pruritus, dispigmentation, palmoplantar keratoderma, nail changes, non-scarring diffuse alopecia, mucous membranes involvement, and systemic manifestations are generalized lymphadenopathy, peripheral edema, fever, chilly sensations, hepatosplenomegaly. Typical signs uh, uh, of erythroderma in our observation, skin itching and uh, burning, nail changes, palmoplantar keratoderma, genital involvement. And next, hyperpigmentation, uh, alopecia diffuse, lichenification, and mucosal involvement. Psoriatic erythroderma was the most frequent of all erythroderma forms, 30%. The main causes of erythroderma in patients with psoriatic were inadequate topical therapy, alcohol abuse, aggravation of comorbidities. Clinical clues of psoriatic erythroderma, personal or family history of psoriasis, pre-existing psoriatic plaques, withdrawal of corticosteroids, Nail changes, oil drops, pits, or nihilizes, inflammatory arthritis often spares the face. Histologic clues of psoriatic erythroderma, confluent parakeratosis, reduced granular layer, bottleneck like rate ridges, tortoise vessels in papillary dermis, neutrophils in epidermis. Clinical clues of atopic erythroderma, personal or family history of atopy, pre-existing lesions, severe 
pruritus, excoriations, lichenification, atopic phase. Exematose erythroderma, non-atopic, pre-existing localized disease, distribution of initial lesions, review of oral medications, patch testing, occupation and hobbies, histopathology, variable spongiosis. Lichen planus, erythrodermic form of lichen planus, typical lesions and violet color, and typical, uh, <coughs> typical whitish plaque uh, in mucous membrane. Pemphigus foliaceus, erythrodermic form, pre-existing lesions, often on upper trunk, impetigo-like erosions and vesicles, moist scale crust, cornflake uh, scale, uh, direct immunofluorescence, intercellular immunoglobulin G, histopathology, acantolysis, superficial epidermis. Pteriasis rubra pilaris, diagnostic clues, uh, are salmon colored erysema, islands of sparring, perifollicular keratotic papules, voxy keratoderma, flares after uh, sun exposure, histopathology, psoriasiform epidermal hyperplasia, alternating parakeratosis, uh, and orthokeratosis. Crusted scabies or Norwegian scabies, patients with compromised immune systems and elderly, people uh, with HIV, transplant patients, highly contagious state, involving flexural regions, histologic scabetic mite, scabala in stratum corneum, perivascular uh, infiltrates with eosinophils. Secondary erythroderma, uh, uh, rare uh, erythrodermic uh, form of Darier dyskeratosis follicular. And rare uh, erythrodermic form of Pteriasis rosa, irritating uh, Pteriasis rosa. Drug reactions. Uh, erythrodermic form. No history of skin diseases usually resolves within two six weeks after withdrawal of responsible drug, uh, preceded by morbiliform or scarlatiniform exanthem, facial edema, independent RS may become purpuric. Drugs which may cause erythroderma. More than 100 drugs. Chronic primary erythroderma in uh, adult, uh, ichthyosiform bullous uh, erythroderma. Paraneoplastic erythroderma. In case of solid organ malignancies, usually late stage, lymphoproliferative disorders, inclusive uh, other types of uh, T-cell lymphoma. Cachexia, melanoerythroderma, fine scaling. Paranew uh, plastic erythroderma uh, we observed in 16 patients. And liver cancer and uh, prostate uh, cancer. Idiopathic erythroderma. Diagnostic clues are elderly patients, chronic relapsing, Severe pruritus, palmoplantar keratoderma, dermatopathic lymphadenopathy, consider less commonly associated drugs, continue to re-evaluate for cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, histopathology non-specific. Physical uh, exam for erythroderma, keratoderma, alopecia, Mucosal involvement, uh, nail changes, and uh, uh, chills or hypothermia, lymphadenopathy, uh, hepatomegaly, uh, and uh, fever. 
consequences of acute skin failure, hemodynamic changes, impaired thermoregulatory control, metabolic complications, fluid and electrolyte imbalance, loss of uh, nutrients. Peripheral uh, edema is common in long-standing cases. It's prob uh, probable uh, causes are increased capillary leakage and consequent shift of uh, fluid to extravascular uh, spaces. Uh, typical hyperalbuminemia associated cardiac failure and uh, inflammation resulting from the primary skin disease. Long-term complications of uh, acute uh, skin uh, failure. Complications uh, of the eyes. Ectropion, entropion, corneal scarring, simblepharon, and secondary Sika syndrome. Uh, nail, uh, both lines, splinter hemorrhage, uh, distal onycholysis, dystrophy, and total shedding of nail. Uretra, stricture, and uh, uh, phimosis. And hair scarring, alopecia, esophagus, dysphagia resulting from structure, and vagina, synechia. And uh, the skin complications, pigmentary changes, hypo and hyperpigmentation, hypohidrosis, contracture. Important parameters to be monitoring, uh, monitored in patients with acute skin uh, failure, clinical, biochemical, hematological, and microbiological. Fluid electrolyte uh, replacement and nutrition in patients with acute skin uh, failure, intravenous fluid, uh, and nasogastric uh, uh, feeding. and fluid electrolyte uh, uh, replacement by uh, electrolytes, hypokalemia and uh, hyponatremia. Definite indications of antibiotic use, high bacterial count from skin, catheter sample or urine, of urine, sudden hypothermia in a relatively stabilized patient, confused mental status, anxiety, symptoms of infection uh, pertaining to a particular uh, system. Treatment options of various uh, forms of erythroderma for lichen planus, psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, eczema, pizzeriasis, rubra pilaris, and for lymphoma, exfoliative dermatitis, idiopathic, scabious erythrodermic form, crusted form, toxic epidermal necrolysis. Key points. Patients with extensive skin lesions may be febrile even in absence of infection. Sudden onset hypothermia in a relatively stabilized patient may be a premonitory sign of septic uh, shock. A pulse rate of 120 or more a minute, even in presence of precipitation, uh, factors like septicemia uh, and fever indicates a negative fluid balance. Increased respiratory rate may be the first sign of hypoxia resulting from pneumonia edema. A reduction uh, in urine volume may be an early indicator of hypovolemia or septicemia. In altered sensorium in the form of uh, anxiety or confusion may be the first sign of sepsis. In residual gastric aspirate volume is more than 50 uh, milliliter periodic feeding uh, is to be withheld. Aggressive fluid correction may precipitate high uh, output uh, heart failure in patients with compromised cardiovascular system or may give rise to pulmonary edema. The poor prognostic factors in uh, acute uh, skin failure, older age, larger body surface area involvement, presence of severe 
neutropenia, early thrombocytopenia, high blood urea nitrogen level, causative drug with long half-life in drug induced causes. Causes of mortality in patients with acute skin failure, erythroderma, important causes of mortality, high output cardiac failure, adult respiratory distress syndrome, capillary leak syndrome, sepsis. Syndrome Stevens-Johnson, toxic epidermal necrolysis, uh, massive fluid and electrolyte loss, prerenal uremia, septicemia, pulmonary embolism, adult respiratory distress syndrome, gastrointestinal hemorrhage, acute generalized postular psoriasis, hypocalcemia, oligomia, acute tubular necrosis of kidney, pemphigus, sepsisemia, fluid and electrolyte imbalance, and staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, important causes of mortality, uh, sepsisemia. Conclusion. Acute skin failure constitutes a dermatological emergency that requires a multidisciplinary, intensive care approach. Adequate knowledge about monitoring these patients and hospitalization in specialized units can reduce the high mortality and morbidity associated with the condition. Thank you for your attention and invite you uh, to the sixth annual meeting of the Eurasian uh, Association of Dermatovenerologists in April 2016 in Minsk, Belarus. Thank you. Dear Professor Leskevich, thank you for your presentation. Are there any questions? If no, thank you once more. Dear friends, it, it is my pleasure to give honorary member our Professor Adaskevich, who is president of uh, Belarusian Association of Dermatovenologists, about her input in uh, our association. Please next uh, <coughs> presentation uh, from Latvia, Riga, Sylvester, Sylvester Rubens, Boulevard Diseases, please. Thank you. 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 So, my name is Dr. Rubins, my presentation is uh, Woolward Diseases. Uh, it is actually, for, for me, a rather new theme. Uh, we were asked uh, last, last year by Professor Katsambas uh, from Greece to write a chapter in his new textbook, uh, uh, Handbook of uh, Dermatological Treatments, which will come out uh, this year, so, and, and we, we wrote it, and, and uh, I find many interesting things for myself, and I hope also it will be interesting for you. Uh, so, vulva is an interesting organ. It is a, a gynecological organ with dermatological anatomy. And the spectrum of potential vulvar diseases is large, although only few of them are uniquely vulvar. Uh, vulvar infections are the most common, uh, while vulvar cancer is very rare. And it is also a little bit interesting because uh, we know that from Professor Zurhausen's lecture when he told that uh, that infections uh, facilitate the cancer. So here it's a little bit opposite. And there is uh, no uniform classification of vulvar diseases. Uh, anatomy of vulva, some, some main uh, things. Uh, so as we know, vulva is a female external genitalia and it includes mons pubis, labia majora, labia minora, clitoris, vestibulum, and, and vestibular glands. Arterial blood is provided by internal podendal artery, uh, venous returned by podendal veins. Uh, vulvar lymphatics drain to inguinal and femoral nodes. Uh, lymph from midline vulva drains bilaterally. It's important uh, for, for oncology uh, to know when if the tumor is, is located in the midline, then uh, you have to excise uh, bilateral lymph nodes. 
Innervation of wool is performed by three nerves, ilioinguinal, posterior, femoral, cutaneous, and pudendal. And wool lies in, in close proximity to lower abdomen, inguinal and perianal regions, uh, vagina, uret, and anus. That's why its mic microbial diversity and load of uh, wool area is much higher than in other parts of the skin. And another interesting aspect of vulva is that uh, papillary dermis is absent in, in clitoris and labia minora. So um, uh, there is an organization called um, ISSVD, which stands for International Society for Study of Vulvar Diseases. And the uh, latest classification uh, looks like this. It's a little bit simplified version but uh, as you know here they, they are dividing all diseases into into eight groups and and then these groups are further subdivided so this is more more detailed version uh, we we made uh, ourselves uh, we call it uh, rvcvd uh, 2013 uh, our own classification when we wrote this book because when you compare these two, you can see that this uh, ISSVD is mostly the, they use a principle of villainism. They just describe uh, the lesions, and the opposite principle is the so-called alibertism that you describe also the nosology. So, and, uh, and of course, this uh, ISVD stands more for, for, for dermatosis, but it is, uh, it is not uh, including all, all, all potential diseases of vulva. So this means that I think we as dermatologists shall probably play a more active role in this classification because ISSVD is mostly composed of gynecologists and for gynecologists they, they don't know who very well. Uh, and, the, and now a little bit about some entities, uh, vulvar ulcers and vulvitides. So there can be two main uh, causes, one is infectious and non-infectious non-infectious and from infectious uh, the most common cause is uh, candida and other common causes herpes, donovanosis, lymphogranuloma venereum, streptococcal ulcers and vulvitis, ulcus mole and some rare causes uh, which also can cause vulvar ulcers, tuberculosis and diphtheria and from in non-infectious the most common is Bechstein disease, pioderma gangrenosum, Crohn's disease, vulvitis, circumscripta plasma cellularis, and the so-called seminal or postcoital vulvitis. Uh, there is an overview, you probably don't see much here, uh, about uh, different et entities, etiology and diagnosis and treatment, but about syphilis, herpes, candida, I think it's more or less known, I, I will not go in details. Uh, vulva dermatosis, uh, uh, which can be seen in vulva, are numerous, starting with different erythemas, intertrigo, erysipelas, vitiligo, and so on, and, and uh, including also bullous diseases, haley haley disease, Darius disease, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, and other drug eruptions. Besides, uh, vulval involvement can occur also in pathologies of other organs and systems, uh, like Crohn's disease, like HIV-AIDS, uh, and, and others. And the diagnostic principles and treatment used in vulvar dermatosis are similar to other parts of the body, with maybe some ex exceptions of local, local treatment. And uh, vulvar itch, uh, some, one slide about it, uh, it is a very common symptom. And besides, besides anamnesis and clinical aspects, the age of patient is very important. In young women, uh, it is mostly caused by infections. In, uh, in postmenopausal, it's more often due to lichen sclerosis, uh, uh, vein, other benign and malignant tumors. Uh, and treatment is also depending on etiology, mostly it's local or systemic anti-effectives, corticosteroids, calcineurin inhibitors, surgery, and oncologic drugs. Uh, there is uh, one uh, modality, the so-called vulvodynia, which is, which is more, uh, it is a vulvar pain, uh, burning sensation and dyspareunia without obvious uh, physical uh, cause. And formerly it was known as burning wall syndrome and more correctly can be called idoiodinia. And uh, it is estimated that some uh, 10 to 20 percent of females are uh, affected worldwide and it can be uh, classified into generalized and localized types uh, localized for example clitorodinia, hemivulodinia, vulvovestibulitis syndrome uh, the pathogenesis is not known, but uh, disturbed pain reception, vulvar hypersensitivity, uh, 
psychosexual problems, vaginal infections are, are the proposed uh, uh, mechanisms, factors. And uh, diagnosis is based on anamnesis, clinical examination, pain assessment via Q-tip test or tampon test. And treatments, there are different options starting from local to systemic. Uh, now a rather new drug is uh, amitriptyline cream. And some other uh, options include uh, vag uh, vaginal creams with conjugated estrogens, pelvic floor physiotherapy, biofeedback, and, and other. Uh, Bulvar lichens, uh, uh, I don't know, is this uh, maybe the correct term? Theoretically, it could be also called lichenid reactions, and, but the three most common forms are uh, lichen simplex chronicus, vulvar lichen planus, and lichen sclerosus. Uh, lichen simplex chronicus appears as, uh, as lichenification of labial surfaces with fissures and slight scaling, and intent sometimes at bearable each is a chief complaint. Each scratch cycle maintains a pathological process, and etiological uh, factors can be numerous, including atopic eczema, contact dermatitis, other pruritic anogenital diseases. Many cases are idiopathic. Uh, diagnosis is based on clinical picture and skin biopsy. And first-line treatment is with ultra-potent corticosteroids uh, for 4 to 12 weeks. Second-line treatment is topical calcineurin inhibitors. And other alternatives are peroral prednisolone or intramuscular tiamcinolone. Uh, vulva lichen planus uh, has three clinical forms in vulva, uh, the so-called classical papulous squamous, erosive, and hypertrophic. Erosive lichen planus is the most common type. And typical symptoms include burning, itch, and dysperiunia. Uh, vaginal scarring and stenosis may occur in long-standing disease. And vulvovaginal, uh, vulvovaginal gingival syndrome is a subtype of uh, this erosive lichen planus, where erosive descomate lesions are seen on vagina or on gingiva, usually not simultaneously. And first-line treatment is, is, is uh, also similar to lichen sclerosis, very potent topical corticosteroids, and alternatives are topical calcineurin inhibitors and other. And uh, what is important to note is that uh, some 5% of erosive type uh, can progress to, uh, to YAN, it is uh, the vulvar interepithelial neoplasia, and some percent, 5% to squamous cell carcinoma. So it, is, uh, it is, can be regarded as precancerous lesion. Uh, lichen sclerosis is a chronic disease of phonogenital region. Uh, although etiology is not known, autoimmune factors such as autoantibodies to extra extracellular matrix or basement membrane zone, Borrelia burgdorferi infection, uh, hormonal and genetic factors can have a role. And clinically, it starts as a sharp demarcated erythema on clitoris and upper part of labia minora, then gradually involves all of labia minora, spreads to labia minora and perineum, developing the classic uh, lichen sclerosis picture, uh, single or multiple porcelain white plaques. Uh, vaginal scarring and narrowing are typical complications. Uh, first and second line treatment are similar to other lichens. Uh, the difference is, is in other treatment options, which can include also systemic or local retinoids, uh, P PDT, and phototherapy and surgery. And there is an overview, I think it's difficult to see. Uh, vulvar malignancies, so uh, four main uh, types, the so-called vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia, vulvar carcinoma, and vulvar melanoma, and other, other cancers. Uh, vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia is a carcinoma in situ, and again, according to the latest uh, classification, 2004, of ISSVD, uh, it is divided into three types, usual, differentiated, and, and unclassified, and the usual type is further subdivided into warty, basaloid, and mixed uh, types. And all uh, winds which neither belong to usual nor differentiated type are unclassified. Uh, usual type wind can be regarded as HIP, HPV associated or caused disease. And uh, it is, uh, although the HPV positivity is not as high as in cervical cancer, more than 50% of basaloid and warty type wind are positive for HPV 16 and 18 DNA. And differentiated type win uh, in 30 to 50 cases uh, uh, shows association or develop in lichen sclerosis. Um, diagnosis of win is usually uh, is visual uh, and also colposcopy, 
biopsy and histology. Cytology is not a reliable method and HPV DNA testing uh, uh, phosphorylated ribosomal S6 in biopsy can be additional value to separate usual and differentiated type uh, YNN. And treatment options include laser ablation or excision, skinning vulvectomy, wide local excision, 5% imiquimod uh, cream. Wide local excision is regarded as the most effective method. So there's some overview. Uh, Vulvar uh, squamous cell carcinoma, uh, two different pathways are proposed for uh, squamous cell carcinoma. One is HPV dependent and the other is lichen sclerosis. In the first uh, high risk types of HPV, uh, for example, 16 trigger usual type wind development and later water basalate type SCC. In the second type, uh, keratinizing uh, squamous cell carcinoma develops from differentiated uh, wind uh, within a background of lichen sclerosis. And diagnosis of treatment uh, of over STC is according to the so-called FIGO staging and treatment recommendation. FIGO is an international uh, organization of gynecologists and obstetricians. Uh, recurrence rate in, in squamous cell carcinoma is, in vulva is high, especially with tumor size of more than 35 millimeters, tumor-free surgical margin of less than 8 millimeters, and depth of stromal invasion of more than 4 uh, millimeters. And there is a, an overview of, of um, uh, this treatment of vulva SCC. So in FIGO uh, uh, 1A, it's usually wide local excision with 1% uh, peripheral margin. In FIGO 1B, it's uh, similar, but the peripheral margin is larger, 2 to 4 centimeters. And then uh, starting from uh, stage 2, it's already is hemivulvectomy or radical vulvectomy with lymph nodectomy, and the peripheral margin is, in, is 5 uh, centim centimeters. And then uh, in stage 3, uh, radiotherapy, chemotherapy is added. And in, uh, in stage four and metastat metastatic, uh, about all these treatments, also the, some new drugs, the so-called epidermal growth factors, uh, uh, inhibitors like erlotinib or gefitinib or rafatinib can be, can be used. Uh, vulva melanoma, uh, uh, vulva is the most common site of mucosal melanomas, and vulva melanoma is the second most common vulva malignancy after SCC and postmenopausal women are typically affected. Uh, what is interesting with vulvar melanomas in comparison to cutaneous and, and, and vaginal melanomas, it has a high percentage of the so-called uh, uh, C-kit mutations, which is uh, uh, tyrosine kinase mutations. And uh, the, the usual uh, clinical presentation is pigmented lesion uh, or vulvar mass, pain, itching, and bleeding. And anatomical distribution favors clitoris and labia minora in 60 to 70 percent of cases. Uh, uh, and mucosal uh, lentiginous melanoma, nodular and superficial spreading melanoma are the three most common types in vulva. But uh, we shall not forget that about 10 percent of all vulva melanomas are amelanotic or desmoplastic. And these amelanotic melanomas, for example, can simulate uh, lichen sclerosis or be associated with it. And diagnosis of vulvar melanomas is, is established histologically with help of immunohistochemistry, uh, similar to, uh, to skin melanomas. Uh, uh, Clark Breslow is used for staging, but also there's so-called Chang system, uh, which is used for microstaging. And the correct and precise mapping of sentinel lymph nodes in inguinal femoral area can be substantially improved with uh, 3D fusion images of SPECT on CT scans. Uh, positive uh, sentinental lymph nodes are found in 20 to 30 percent of uh, cases of vulvar melanoma. And uh, another thing which should be done is the so-called molecular screening for activated kit mutations shall be done. Uh, treatment depends on anatomical location, size of tumor, depth of invasion, stage of disease. A wide local excision is preferred for thin lesions less than one millimeter, hemivulvectomy or radical vulvectomy with bilateral inguinal femoral lymphadenectomy for deeper lesions with nodal involvement. Uh, again, there is an overview of treatment uh, stage 1 to 3 vulvar melanoma. And treatment modalities for stage 4 metastatic uh, vulvar melanoma 
so several several main strategies one is surgery a radical bullectomy with five centimeter peripheral margin margin plus the so-called pelvic exanteration and then uh, polychemotherapy uh, different schemes uh, dvp is the most most common radiotherapy is mostly palliative and uh, also several new the so-called biological drugs interleukin 2 CTLA-4 antibodies, ipilimumab, tremelimumab, CKIT inhibitors, imatinib, nilotinib, anti-PD-1, nivolimab, lambrozilumab, combined treatments using, for example, ipilimumab plus interleukin-2. And the last uh, is a method is called adoptive cell transfer. It, is, uh, it was elaborated already some 30 years ago. It's probably it's not so popular because it it's requires specialized labs, but it can, can give a very good response. Uh, in this method, uh, tumor in, the so-called tumor infiltrating lymphocytes are taken from melanoma patient, cultured and reinfused back, and the re response rate uh, can, can range from 20 to, to uh, 70 percent. Uh, and uh, coming to the end, um, uh, there is also such a, uh, descriptions as vulvar injury and trauma. A vulva can be traumatized or deformed by sharp or blunt trauma, rape, sexual abuse, mutilation, diseases, chemical and other agents. Uh, female genital mutilation or female circumcision is a ritual or religious practice of some communities, mainly in Africa, Middle East. Uh, top three countries practicing uh, female genital mutilation are Egypt, Sudan and Mali. And the average age of girls is 10 years. And depending on the extent of FGM, it is graded into four types. The most common is type 2, when clitoris and labia minora are removed. And this, uh, this procedure is bound with many complications, psychosocial trauma, acute and chronic pain, bleeding, infection, cysts, narrowing of vaginal opening, uh, partum and postpartum risks. And then uh, there is also a, a block of diseases called structural pathologies and vulva, which can include acquired defects, uh, synechia, fusion of labia, stenosis, or congenital anomalies such as agenesis of labia, imperforate heme, malformation of clitoris, hypospadia, female uretra, hermaphroditismus, and female uh, pseudohermaphroditismus. And treatment is, is most, when possible, is mostly surgical. And uh, diagnosis of over diseases, so different methods are used, uh, combination of, of dermatology and, uh, and gynecology, Microscopy culture, uh, patch test, prick test, dermatoscopy, colposcopy, confocal microscopy, histology, immunohistochemistry, pain assessment tests, blood and hormonal analysis, ultrasound, magnetic resonance imaging, PCR, uh, molecular screening for activated CKIT mutations, and others. And treatment options also are very wide, uh, including antibiotics, antifungals, antivirals, immunosuppressive biologics, cryotherapy, PDT, phototherapy, lasers, radiofrequency surgery, and of course, uh, local therapy. And in summary, uh, vulva is a gynecologic organ with dermatologic anatomy, and no uniform classification of vulvar diseases is, exists. Early diagnosis and treatment of vulvar cancer is unsatis unsatisfactory, usually they are uh, diagnosed very late. Uh, price of new oncologic drugs, it has been uh, widely disputed in also in dermatological community. Some of these new drugs can cost up to uh, half a million dollars a year. So it is uh, for patients difficult to buy. And part of this presentation uh, will be included as a new chapter in this handbook of dermatological treatments by Katsamba Slot in, in Springer 2014. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, any questions? Maybe comments, please. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Next speaker from Taiwan, Cheng Chelang, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizing committee, especially Professor Rubens, for the invitation to this beautiful city and wonderful Congress. I'm Chen Chelan from Kaohsiung Medical University, Taiwan. Uh, 
Today I'm going to talk about phototherapy in dermatology, immune, immune regulation versus biostimulation. I'm going to start this presentation with a history and biologic effect of light, then moving on briefly on photoimmunotherapy. Then I'm going to focus this presentation mostly on UVB-induced biostimulation. I'm going to use vitiligo as a model for investigation and end with a brief summary and discussion. Well, the scientific discovery of light was first pioneered by Sir Isaac Newton in 1666. He used a prism that shows that the apparently white solar radiation actually can appear in seven different colors. And this fact was ignored for about 150 years until in 1800, William Herschel found that if you place a thermometer just beyond the red region of the visible light, you can get an increase of temperature. So in 1800, infrared radiation was found. A year later, Ritter found that if you just place a chloride solution beyond the violet region of the visible spectrum, you can turn the color of chloride region, of chloride solution. And here, the ultraviolet radiation was found. So in the sequence of events, we have discovery of visible light, we have infrared radiation, and then comes the ultraviolet radiation. And nowadays, we know more about this different spectrum of radiation. We know that visible light and infrared accounts for majority of solar radiation, accounting for 39% and 54% of solar radiation, respectively. UV only accounts for 7% of the solar radiation. But the thing is, whenever we think about UV uh, solar radiation, most of us will come to the conclusion that we are talking about UV. And why is that? Because we all believe that UV has a higher energy, it has a more predictable photoreactivity, and its association with skin cancer is undeniable. Actually, you can produce a purely UVB-derived de skin cancer on an animal if you just treat them with UVB alone for more than 20 weeks. So seminal study that was performed in the 1970s demonstrated that skin cancer from UV irradiated mice could not be transplanted onto a normal age and sex match recipient mice with same genetic background. This skin cancer can only grow progressively in an immune compromised recipient. Subsequently, Experiments show that skin cancer can grow on mice that receive chronic UVB radiation but has yet developed skin tumor. Therefore, it was concluded that UVB not only induced DNA damage but also creates an immune suppressive environment. So to study the immune suppressive effect of UV, we can not only rely on the tumor carcinogenic model because it will take a long time to perform, usually more than half a year for a single experiment. So immunologists have employed what, what we call a contact hypersensitivity model in which that if you treat these mice with repeated low dose of UVB or a single high dose of UVB, you can suppress the contact hypersensitivity of these mice. And with these experiments, now we know a lot more about how UV-induced immune suppression. We know it's more complicated than we originally anticipated. It can affect Langerhan cells, thermal dendritic cells, and thermal mass cells. And here I'll briefly talk about the thermal how mass cell was affected after UV treatment. After you treat mouse skin with a UV treatment, you got recruitment of thermal mass cells onto the skin, followed by their infiltration to the regional lymph node. And in the regional lymph node, they produce immune suppressive interleukin 10 cytokine that inhibits the formation, proper formation of germinal center. And this way, after UV treatment, you don't get a adequate, adequate production of antibody. And that's, that's one of the mechanism that's responsible for UV-induced immune suppression. So back to dermatology. When we give our patients UV treatment, especially UVB treatment, what we think about is the, UV, is the immune suppressive therapy. So we feel very comfortable giving our patients uh, UVB therapy for treatment of psoriasis because of a lot of inflammatory cells that was seen in the, uh, under the microscopy. And we're comfortable giving our patients UV therapy for cutaneous lymphomas because these abnormal, atypical lymphocytes infiltrate our skin. But we also use different 
phototherapy for different purposes. And one of the classic examples is we use them for treat, treating vitiligo, especially the stable stage vitiligo. We'll talk about it a little later. And we also use different spectrum of UV for different purposes, such as nowadays we use uh, visible lights, the intensive pulse light at the IPL for skin rejuvenation to reduce skin wrinkles and improve skin laxity. I don't have time to go into that today. So back to the main thing of the talk, vitiligo. Vitiligo vulgaris, also known as non-segmental vitiligo, is an acquired disorder with loss of melanocytes in the epidermis and occasionally the hair. It accounts for about 1% of the world population and treatment for vitiligo can be difficult. There are two types of vitiligo, the vitiligo vulgaris or the non-segmental vitiligo, where you see that the pigmentation is usually symmetric, progressive, and is associated with autoimmune disease. A different type of vitiligo is the segmental vitiligo, where the lesions are usually distributed in a dermatomal or quasi-dermatomal quasi distribution. It's not associated with autoimmune disease. It usually progresses for about one year, and the disease just stops. It's difficult to treat unless if you graft the patient with epidermal grafting, it responds to surgical therapy. But the stages of vitiligo can be divided into different stages, such as during active vitiligo, where you see progressive depigmentation of the skin and destruction of the melanocytes. The stable stage of vitiligo, where you see no new depigmentation and you see no destruction of melanocytes. The skin is just waiting to repigment, and of course, the repigmenting vitiligo. The phototherapy for vitiligo consists of a conventional phototherapy, such as PUVA, the standard phototherapy that we use right now, the narrowband UVB therapy, the more recently introduced excimer light therapy, and the visible light therapy that we use at our institution that I don't have time to talk about today. So for today's purpose, I'm only going to focus on UVB because we're most familiar with UVB. So we know that when you use UVB to treat vitiligo patients, they will develop repigmentation, and one of the most common form of repigmentation is the follicular pattern of repigmentation. In this pattern of repigmentation, you see formation of follicular islands around the hair follicle. And the mechanism behind this follicular pattern of repigmentation is that the melanocyte stem cells residing on the bulge area of the outer root sheath of the hair, it becomes activated, move out of its niche, undergoes an upward migration and start to produce melanin to the nearby keratinocytes. And so in this process, the most crucial event that has to occur is the functional development of melanocyte stem cells. So now I'm going to focus on mechanisms of excimer light and narrowband UVB irradiation induced immature pigment cell development. Since early 2000, Excimer light has been used for different dermatologic purposes. It was first used for treatment of psoriasis, and then it was used for vitiligo treatment. And if you look at these early reports and the later reports to confirm the finding, is that if you use excimer light to treat vitiligo, you, if you compare the treatment profile with narrowband UVB, you will find that excimer light has a more favorable profile as compared to narrowband UVB. Excimer light offers a more rapid initial repigmentation, and it has a high response rate, even for treating segmental vitiligo, which is more difficult to treat. And in our own experience, we acquired this uh, excimer light in 2004. We shared the same clinical experience, in which we found that both segmental and non-segmental vitiligo lesion would show repigmentation, sign of repigmentation, within only one month. That's only eight sessions of photo treatment. And this is, this is very exciting because for segmental vitiligo lesions, it, it is relatively difficult to repigment unless you give them more than six, uh, in our experience, more than six to eight weeks of narrowband therapy initially. But now with this new device, we can tell patients, mo it is most likely you will see repigmentation within only eight sessions. That's one month. And if you follow this patient for three months, you will see that the patients that respond to um, excimer light is almost similar if segmental vitiligo patients and non-segmental vitiligo patients. And what's more important is that we have 17 patients who previously failed narrowband UVB therapy also showed response to excimer light. 
So if you think of it, think about this phenomenon carefully, it is a very intriguing clinical phenomenon because the operational wavelength of narrowband UVB is 311 nanometers. It's very similar to excimer light, which peaks at 308 nanometers. So could the clinical difference be due to the three nanometer difference in their peak wavelength of these UVB irradiation source? Another difference between excimer light and narrowband UVB is the high irradiance delivered by the excimer light. That's mini watt per centimeter square. In other words, clinically, if you want to give a patient 50 mini joule per centimeter square of narrowband UVB, it can take minutes. But for excimer light, it will only take seconds. But at the end of the day, you are only giving patients 50 mini joules per day. That's the difference of irradiance. So the different clinical outcome cannot be explained by the common law that states that equal fluence, equal mini joules per centimeter square, gives equal photochemical responses. The mechanism ex explaining why excimer is more efficient than narrowband UVB in repigmenting with LIGO posed a clinical enigma. So we must first look back at the skin and uh, light and skin interaction. If you look at the tissue optic between light and skin interaction, you will know that the light needs to be absorbed by the chromophore in the skin. And after its absorption by the chromophore in the skin, it undergoes an exciting state, forming relevant photo product and results in cellular changes that's responsible for the acute and chronic skin responses. Now if you look at the um, pathway, the, the chromophore that's receiving UVB when we treat UVB onto our patients, we know that UVB induced DNA damages. That's the classical nuclear pathway. And a new pathway that was described in 2004 tells us that the essential amino acid tryptophan inside the cytoplasm of our cell is another chromo important chromophore for UVB. So once you treat your skin with UVB radiation, the chromophore of your cell will receive this energy, turns into FICZ, which is a ligand for a real hydrocarbon receptor. And this receptor is important for two events. One of the things it would happen is that the real hydrocarbon receptor will move into nucleus, bind to its responsive element, and start to transcribe its signature genes, CYP1A1. The other event that will happen is that the CSARC will dissociate from the aerial hydrocarbon receptor complex and leads to EGFR internalization. The cascade regarding EGFR internalization is less well described, but we know that the two important events that must happen after aerial hydrocarbon receptor activation is you get a transcription of CYP1A1 and you get an internalization of EGFR. As we're doing this study, there's a report in 2011 by Jux et al. They show with a, a real hydrocarbon receptor knockdown mice, they show that a real hydrocarbon receptor is a regulator for UVB-induced pigment cell development. So in their study, using the a real hydrocarbon deficient mice, they show that if you treat these a real hydrocarbon receptor deficient mice with UVB, you get a weaker tanning response, you got a decreased number of dopa positive melanocytes, you got lower tyrosinase activity, and you get reduced expression of SCF and CKIT in melanocytes. So our hypothesis was that excimer light and narrowband UVB may activate a real hydrocarbon receptor related signaling differently due to their different irradiance. And how we approach this problem is we use an immature melanoblast cells and we treat them with the same fluids so we treat them with the same mini joule per centimeter squares of UVB light, either from excimer or from narrowband UVB, and we see what happens. The first result we obtained was actually quite encouraging because after we treat these cells with equivalent fluence, 50 mini joules per centimeter square of, of light energy, what we see is that you tr if you treat these cells with excimer, it actually induces a lot more CYP1A1 transcription then narrowband UVB, and this indicates that we, our hypothesis was actually on the right track. And if you place an irradiance filter in front of the excimer light, and again, you deliver the same fluence, so you cut down the irradiance by half, and you double the amount of time that you treat, you got the same fluence delivered by the same uh, excimer machine, then you will see that the CYP1A1 transcription is much reduced. And 
I said previously that internalization of EGFR is another important event that's associated with a real hydrocarbon receptor activation. And here I show you that after you treat these cells with excimer light, you got a nice internalization of EGFR as demonstrated by the confocal microscopy. And if you do the same experiment using narrowband UVB, you don't find that internalization as prominent. And again, if you repeat the same experiment, but this time with the irradiance filter in place, you will see that EGFR internalization into the cell is much reduced. So brief summary is that excimer light can activate a real hydrocarbon receptor related signaling and reduce EGFR internalization in an irradiance dependent manner. Now we test the biological effect of all these events. As demonstrated in this slide, if you treat these immature melanoblast cells with excimer light, you will induce tyrosinase expression of these immature cells. But if you treat them with the same fluence of narrowband UVB, you don't get an induction of tyrosinase. And same thing at protein level. Because we have seen the prominent EGFR internalization after excimer light treatment, we wonder if EGFR can serve as a transcription factor and bind to tyrosinase promoter when it enters the cell. So we perform chromatin immunoprecipitation assay to test if our hypotheses were true. And as clearly demonstrated in this slide, if you treat uh, these cells with excimer light, you will see that there is a prominent binding between nuclear EGFR and tyrosinase promoter. But if you do the same experiment with narrowband UVB or with the filter in place, Again, with excimer light, you don't see the binding between nuclear EGFR and tyrosinase promoter. And now to complete the picture, you put the excimer irradiance filter in place. You don't get the internalization of EGFR. And as expected, you don't get the uh, induction of tyrosinase expression. So to complete the picture, we perform a gene silencing experiment where we silence the area hydrocarbon receptor expression in our cells. And as you can see here, if we do this experiment, we will see that the SARC expression is not increased after the excimer light treatment. The EGFR is not internalized after the excimer treatment. And as expected, the tyrosinase expression is much reduced if you gene silence, knock down the AHR expression in the primitive menaloblast cells. So in summary, Besides the classical area hydrocarbon receptor binding, we propose that EGFR may serve as a transcription factor after high irradiance UVB therapy to induce melanoblast differentiation. And we believe this is what happened after you treat melanoblast cells with high irradiance UVB. You activate the area hydrocarbon receptor. You make the EGFR go into the cell nucleus where it binds with the tyrosinase transcription factor and starts the differentiation, differentiation process of melanoblast cells. So I hope in the past 20 minutes or so, I have, I have shown you that there are different mechanisms that were involved for vitiligo repigmentation induced by different phototherapies. I have just shown you for excimer light, the mechanism involved is the nuclear translocation of EG, is the activation of a real hydrocarbon receptor, the translocation of EGFR, and the transcription of tyrosinase. But what about narrowband UVB? UVB narrowband UVB can also induce repigmentation in, in vitiligo. The mechanism involved for narrowband UVB induced vitiligo repigmentation is that narrowband UVB acts on keratinocytes to produce BFGF and ET1. That induces the maturation of melanocyte blast cells. I don't have time to go into that today, but that was done in our previous studies. But I think the crucial point here is that previous study on phototherapy focused on fluence delivered. Currently, I hope I have demonstrated and convinced you that irradiance is also a critical parameter that is responsible for the biological effects of UV therapy. And another important thing that I don't have time to talk about is that different stages of disease require different treatment protocol. In case of vitiligo, the protocol for treating active depigmentation is certainly different from stable stages of disease because in active depigmentation, what you want is immune suppression. And the 
treatment protocol you give for immune suppression is definitely different than when you try to do a biostimulation or you try to repigment a stable lesion. So the alienation of the photoimmunological and biological effects of different lights will not only enhance the phototherapeutic efficacy of phototherapy, but will also promote better health, since we human beings will continue to have intimate interactions with different spectrum of light, either outdoors with sunlight or indoors with the newer indoor illumination. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Cheng Chi Lan. Uh, are we, do we have some questions? If not, thank you, and thank you all for coming. We are closing our session. Thank you. <laughs>